All right, guys, Murph's here. And today I want to go over episode two of our World War II rifle comparison series. Now, a couple of things I need to throw out in case you guys are some latecomers to the series and the channel. This is not a super big channel. I don't have sponsors. I don't have a Patreon. I don't have access to museums and all that kind of stuff to be able to get you guys a comprehensive video on all the guns of World War II. I'm not a CNR Arsenal who did like a two-year series on every gun used in World War I. I look forward to seeing our arsenal expanding World War II, and I will be among the many, many people watching those videos, but this is not that. Now, what I do have is access to a friend of mine who has a fairly decent sized military surplus collection, including quite a few rifles from World War II, enough so that I can do one rifle per country involved in World War II. Well, at least a couple of the countries involved in World War II. The major players, at the very least. So, with that being the case, that is what we'll be reviewing in this series, one rifle per country, all of its successes and negatives, and then we'll put that together into a point value system that will be described later on. Now, in addition to that, guys, these videos are going to take a while. They're going to be very long videos. With that being the case, I'm going to annotate in the description where different parts of the video take place so that you can skip ahead to those parts, get the information that you want, and get on about your day. Time is precious, and I'm not looking to take any more of your time than what you're willing to give me. I hope at some point you'll come back and watch the entire video, but I also understand needing to just get the wave tops of what it is that we're talking about and on to the next thing that you need to worry about. All right, that pretty much takes care of our kind of caveats and breakdown of how this is going to work, so let's go ahead and get into the review. And let's talk about episode two, which covers this. A Russian Mosin Nagant 9130 chambered in 7.62 by 5.4 rimmed. Now, in order to talk about this rifle, we do need to talk about a little bit of history. So, starting in 1882, the Russians decided that they wanted to adopt a repeating rifle. At the time, they were using a single shot cartridge fed rifle and decided that they needed to get with the times. That was where the trend was going, was repeating arms. Now, it took like three different commissions and a bunch of back and forth between designs trying to figure out what the Russian military actually wanted to standardize around. During this time period, smokeless powder would come out and then also a couple of legal battles that would wind up with some royalties and some legal fees as well as copyright infringements or patent infringements coming into play. Ultimately, Finally, nine years later in 1891, the commission would settle upon a rifle design from a gentleman named Mosin and a magazine design from two brothers named Nagant from Belgium. And that is how we got the 1891 Mosin-Nagant rifle. Now, this was a three-line caliber cartridge, which is 7.62 millimeter, but that is the Imperial Russian I guess, measurement that was used to describe 7.62 millimeter and had a 28 inch barrel and all this different type of stuff. Anyway, World War I hits and Russia uses the 1891 during that conflict and they use the 1891 through the rise of communism all the way up to the 1930s, which during the interwar period, it was very common for a lot of different militaries to kind of reevaluate their primary infantry arm. Now, what most militaries would do is that they would take their primary military arm, their primary infantry arm, and they would just make a couple of little refinements to it to put it more or less in standard with everything else that was going on at the time, what was trendy at the time. However, Russia didn't do it to the same extent that a lot of other people did. They still kept the 28-inch barrel instead of going with the more trendy short rifle concept, which was a 22 to 24-inch barrel, but they would adjust the sights, dropping a single blade front sight in order to incorporate a circle post protected front sight, as well as the rear sight would go through a redesign. They would ditch the latter rear sight, which was graduated in a measurement known as Arshins, which once again is an Imperial Russian measurement, which equates to roughly the pace count of a man. And they would switch that over to meters. There would also be a couple of other, other smaller design changes with the barrel bands and all that kind of stuff. Not terribly important, except 
for the inclusion of an interrupter switch in the magazine system in order to keep the rimmed cartridge from gumming up on itself. We'll talk about that more here in a little bit. Now this would be referred to as the 9130 and the biggest departure with the 9130 is that the 1891 had a hex receiver and the 9130 would go with a round receiver. And the purpose of this was that during this period the Russian the former Soviet Union entirely is industrializing. They are bringing an industry to countries that didn't previously have industry. And it's a little bit easier and faster to produce a round receiver than it is a hex receiver. There's additional milling requirements and all that kind of stuff. And it's a lot easier to just go with round receiver, pump it out, check it to make sure that it meets the measurements and quality assurance that it's supposed to, and then send it on down to get barreled. That brings us to this rifle that we're talking about here today. Now, the 9130 would be the standard issue arm going into World War II. It would go into Poland. It would march into Finland for the Winter War, which didn't last very long. It would attempt to resist the Finns during the Continuation War, as well as the German onslaught of Operation Barbarossa. Now, Russia, for the second time in the Second World War in the first half of the 20th century, would find themselves unable to keep up with rifle production. Now, during the First World War, it's because nobody foresaw the scale of World War One. That is, they didn't see that coming, and nobody had the rifle production where it needed to be. And it's already very common in very large-scale conflicts for countries to run into issues with rifle production. World War Two was because they were not prepared for the capabilities of the Luftwaffe bombing campaigns as well as the Finns and the Germans cutting off supply routes. So this is where we start to see in like 1942-43 where we have last ditch rifles starting to show up in Russian service where the finish is not necessarily in the best of condition be it the wood or the metal or there might still be some chatter marks on the steel. Now these rifles are still perfectly serviceable because Everybody needs a serviceable arm. You know, it's, it's not helpful to have your soldiers killed by their own weapon system. You need them to use that to kill the enemy. You're just, you also aren't so concerned about a guy living long enough to be concerned about rust on his rifle. That's, that's that dynamic that's being represented there. Now, this would also cause events like what you see in the movie Enemy at the Gates as well as the video game, the first Call of Duty that came out, where... You know, the first man gets a rifle and the second man gets ammunition. And if the first man goes down, the second man grabs up his rifle and continues the fighting. That was a thing for a little bit. Now, and that was even with a lot of the refinements that were made to the production of this very simple rifle. That's kind of shocking overall. That tells you how heavy of a conflict the Great Patriotic War was, as they call it in the Eastern Bloc. Now, eventually... The Russians would stop and then reverse the German onslaught and they would push all the way through Silo Heights into Berlin and this was the rifle that they did it with. Now they, they did come out with a couple of carbine variants, the M38 and M44 carbines, but we're not really going to get into the, into variations of this particular rifle. We're going to kind of try to stay scoped to the 9130 specifically. However, speaking of scoped, there was a sniper rifle variant of the Mosin Nagant, which would have mounted a four power scope over the ejection port. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind with the sniper variants of these rifles. Only 110,000 were made. And that seems like a lot until you take into account that 38 million of these rifles were produced by the time production stopped. 110,000 is not that much. Also, the 9130 would remain in, well, the 9130 sniper would remain in service longer than the 9130 was until the Dragunov came online. So, that, a lot of these rifles, these sniper rifle variants, got used a lot. There are probably more fake Mosin Nagant sniper rifles on the market than there are actual Mosin Nagant sniper rifles. And anytime somebody comes up to you and says that they have an original Mosin Nagant sniper rifle, you need to treat them with a certain amount of uh, incredulity until you manage to figure it out for yourself. Be very suspicious. That is what you need to be. You need to find some manner of being able to prove that that is actually a 9130 sniper and not a fake. It's not a matter of like, oh, well, you know, at the very least someone made a really good representation. It's that generally they try to jack up the price on those rifles and you don't need to pay through the nose for what is not original. Not when it's being cast to you as original. But enough about that. In 1945, Russia would end production of the 9130. 
as they started to bring the Simonov SKS online and then shortly thereafter the AK-47. Now, other satellite nations of the Soviet Union would continue to produce the Mosin Nagant for a couple of reasons. For some people, it was what they could support production of. For others, they already knew that the AK-47 was on the horizon and saw no need to adopt an SKS just to then have to turn around and adopt the AK-47. So those were the guys who didn't wind up having to do this weird stutter step through training guys to use a Mosin Nagant, then an SKS, then a select fire AK-47. They kind of they jumped over that middle ground and that's pretty cool. Now, what happened to these rifles post-war? Well, first off, with you know the Cold War now starting to come online, this whole struggle going on between capitalism and communism, and the possibility of World War III, Russia's not messing around. Not after being caught flat-footed in two different world wars to begin with. So what they decide is if we got this whole like potential mutually assured destruction, rushing across the Volga Gap actually having like World War III kick off, they're not gonna run out of guns. Even if they have to start issuing out non-standard weapon systems, they are not gonna run out of guns. Not this time, mm -mm, not even slightly. So a lot of their Mosinagants go into, into storage and so do a lot of their satellite nations as well. Those rifles go straight into storage, packed in Cosmoline, ready to come out as soon as things turn south. You know, we run out of AKs, we'll issue SKSs. We run out of SKSs, here come the 9130s. However, some of these rifles would also go out as military aid to a lot of the proxy wars that were going on around the world with different communist rebellions. The Chinese would still be issuing out these rifles when Korea kicked off, and you would find these all over that conflict, and these rifles would even show up in Vietnam, as well as a whole slew of other proxy locations as well. So these rifles continued on in quite a bit of combat service afterwards. Now, we get into the 90s and the fall of communism, the Eastern Bloc breaks up, and now all of these new capitalist economies discover that they're a little cash-strapped and they need to start figuring some things out. So what they do is jump into those storage vaults, they bring out these 9130s, and they start selling them on the military surplus market. And these rifles start rolling in in waves and selling for pennies. You could pick up a 9130 for 100 bucks. You could pick up the carbines for about 60 bucks, and you could buy these rifles by the case and really not break a sweat. It's fairly impressive. However, quite a few things would come to impact that. First off, a lot of those countries would run dry on Mosin Nagant rifles, and then in addition to that, there would be a bunch of trade sanctions thrown in on some of the greatest suppliers. There are probably still millions of these rifles sitting in China and Russia. However, because of sanctions and embargoes, we will never see them, which is very unfortunate. So now, pretty much whatever's in the United States, with the exception of a few onesies and twosies still, stri still trickling in, we've got pretty much what we've got. And though 38 million of these rifles were produced, a lot of them got destroyed in battle. And then when you also take into account that, you know, they made them over, they brought them over to these shores, but now house fires and other natural disasters have destroyed a bunch. Uh, guys have sporterized these rifles, which then destroys all the collector's value associated with them. Some people have also uh, blown them up uh, from squib loads or maybe some terrible hand loads on their part. They've, they've completely shattered these guns or they've been taken in police investigations and then destroyed afterwards. There is an ever diminishing number of these rifles in the country every year. And that is why, you know, supply and demand, these guns aren't being produced anymore, and they're not coming in on boats anymore. These rifles have started to appreciate. What you used to be able to pick up for a hundred bucks, you're now seeing between 325, and I've even seen some try to sell for 500. I'm not sure if that was successful, but I've seen them listed for $500. And regardless as to whether or not you think the rifle has that type of value associated with it, it's still a collector's gun. There are still a ton of people out there with a military surplus interest who are still wanting to get a hold of these rifles to have it in their collection. Be it because of movies or video games or an interest in history, they're going to pay those prices for them. Supply and demand. Now, that pretty much covers history, guys. So let's go ahead and start talking about the features of this particular rifle. So, we have a 28-inch barrel and a roughly 8 to 9-pound rifle. 
Now the long barrel, we've talked about this before, but this comes back to an older style of tactic where you would have lines or ranks of men lined up back to front and you would want the rearmost ranks rifle able to get past the front ranks head so they wouldn't accidentally shoot the front rank in the back of the head. Makes a lot of sense, right? However, this tactic more or less got put to rest in World War One with the introduction of the heavy use of machine guns because a line of troops like that is just a prime target for machine guns. Now, for some reason, the Russians decided to keep it around and I'll never understand. But from there, we have our front sight, which has the protected central post. This also works as our bayonet lug. Now, we need to talk about a couple things with this front sight. First off, when it comes to zeroing, a lot, Americans, especially at this time, put a, a heavier premium on the individual marksman more so than foreign military did. Foreign militaries did. So, not every infantryman in a foreign military necessarily sighted in his rifle. In the Soviet military, they would go ahead and get the best marksmen together out of a company or battalion hand them everyone's rifles, and then they just spend a day, a week, however long, zeroing all of the rifles. Now, to the average shooter, especially in the current climate, they would say, oh, well, it's not, in, it's not individualized. The, you know, it's not set up to somebody else's eyes or body mechanics and stuff like that. I'm not saying that's not a thing, but here's the reality of the, the, the overall discussion. I shoot my friend's rifles all the time, right? We go to the range, we shoot each other's guns, Generally, their zero isn't that far off for me. It's not like I'm hitting the, the other target backer next to my target. I'm generally within at least a couple of inches of my point of aim for actual point of impact. It wouldn't be too different in these militaries as well. Now, also take into account that I don't imagine, especially once we get like into the middle of World War II, the Russians were putting a lot of emphasis on individual marksmanship training as much as like a real quick, hey, this is what your rifle looks like, this is how you load it. And especially once we get to the point of like Stalingrad and conscripts, it was probably a whole lot of like, this end is where the bullets come out of, this is where you put the bullets in, and this is the thing that sends them down range. When you survive this battle, we'll talk about the rest. Get, get on out the door, get out of here. So it's, it's, it's a difference in, in overall application and you can debate that all day, but that's just kind of the reality of it. Now. Bayonets also play into this whole zeroing argument because a lot of people will tell you that these rifles were zeroed with the bayonets fixed and this would use a socket type bayonet. Now you also see a lot of pictures of of course the bayonets fixed as well as the bayonets reversed fixed on here so that they were kind of like stored out of the way. Now I've seen articles that say that these rifles were zeroed with the bayonets fixed. I've seen articles say that they were not zeroed with the bayonets fixed. Let's go ahead and put a couple of facts in the place overall so that we can kind of attack this discussion. So first off, bayonets in general. All right, so World War II, bayonets were still absolutely a vital aspect of conflict. That's not necessarily represented today to where I'm pretty sure the army doesn't even train bayonet fighting anymore. And if they do, it's probably like a single afternoon. I can tell you right now that in a current conflict, if someone ran up to me and said, fix bayonets, I would have a couple of questions. You know, starting with, you guys brought bayonets? Why did you guys bring bayonets? That wasn't on the packing list. And then also in addition to what, what life decisions are we making that's causing us to have to use bayonets right now? Can we talk about this? We could definitely come up with a better plan than bayonets. Because I'm pretty sure no American military force has fought with bayonets since like Vietnam in actual conflict. All right, so that's, that's step one. Bayonets are still a viable offensive or defensive aspect of warfare in World War II. Now, Fact number two is that bayonets absolutely do change accuracy. There is an impact on point of impact whenever we talk about bayonets. Now, American shooters at this time, American soldiers were trained to know, were, were still zeroed without a bayonet, but were trained to know what their holdovers would look like with a bayonet. I don't necessarily think the same thing was applied to the Soviet military, which does come into a certain amount of why they would perhaps want their bayonets fixed whenever zeroing or firearms training in general was conducted. I could see that, I could agree with it. And then we run into the third fact, which I think is the most important part. These rifles were zeroed forever ago. This rifle was probably zeroed by a dead man at this point. 
that zero probably isn't that accurate for me, especially when you consider that dead man was probably like 5'6", and I'm 5'10". We got, we got quite a bit of difference in like not just my eyeballs, but like my build overall. So bayonet, no bayonet, zero to me, not zero to me. The only thing that I can control is what I changed about this gun. So if I want this to be zero to, with a bayonet, I need to fix a bayonet and then also get the tools to be able to zero this rifle. If I don't want it zeroed to a bayonet, I need to get the tools and zero this rifle. That's the reality of the matter overall. I can't say one way or the other as to what the actual Russian doctrine was at the time because I haven't seen a manual. And if I did see a manual, I probably wouldn't be able to read it because it'd be in like Cyrillics and I don't read those. But I think we spent enough time on just this end of the rifle. We have so much more that we have to talk about. All right, now we have a full length cleaning rod mounted here at the end of the rifle. This thing's a lot to try to wrangle into the camera angle here, but there's our, our cleaning rod. This is the track that it runs in. Now, up top we have a handguard, which is fantastic for not burning my fingies in the middle of battle. We have what's referred to as a dog collar sling setup. This is an original Russian sling. Now, uh, just as a general aside, we're not going to talk about variants, but slings are one of the first things I pay attention to whenever I look at a rifle uh, on somebody's rifle rack for sale. Slings are the first thing I look at to be able to tell if this is maybe something a little more rare and the seller doesn't know, but we can talk about that another time. Now, running back to our rear sight, this is one of the changes that was made. The original rear sight will have a little more bow to it on the 1891s, and then also has ladder adjustments for it, where this is just a ramp rear sight. Now, that original one was set for arshins, which is a Imperial Russian measurement. This one's set for meters and is set from 100 out to 2,000. Now, I talked about this in episode one, but I'll, I'll try to skate over it really fast in episode two as well. This is where most gun tubers will tell you, well, 2,000 yards would be a, or meters would be a very optimistic engagement range for this rifle. And they're, they're right. If you're trying to shoot a single guy standing out in the field at 2,000 meters with iron sights in your eyeballs, that's, that's kind of a tall order. I'm not saying it's not possible, but I'm saying it's going to be pretty difficult. There's a lot of factors that are at play here that are going to be difficult to account for with this type of side arrangement. In addition to even just being able to identify some guy out there at 2,000 meters who apparently doesn't want to get shot. I have a tendency to get really small when I get shot at, so it'd be really easy to not be found at 2,000 meters. What this site setup is actually meant for is you have a position out there, a large area target that you want to place suppressive fire on, and for some reason you don't have enough or any machine guns. So instead, you get your squad, platoon, company, battalion together, you give them the direction, you know, the target that we're shooting at, you give them the range, and then they set their sights accordingly and they start dropping in gunfire. And at that point, you can suppress an enemy position, you can try to conduct plunging fire or maybe some grazing fire, something along those lines. That's what these sights are set up for, not individual marksmanship on a single target at 2,000 meters. That's a tall order. All right, now, coming back to this section of our stock, right in front of the magazine, you'll see that we have these very deep finger grooves cut in, which are actually a lot to grab onto. I kind of like them, but we'll talk about them more here in a minute. Now, based on our chamber markings here, we have an Izvisk produced 1930 rifle. And we know that furthermore from a distance because we have a hex receiver on what is very clearly a 9130. Now you might be asking, why is that Murph? And that's because of the production date. This is a transitional rifle. So in 1930, when they switched over to the new 9130 pattern, they'd already produced receivers. They'd already gone through the milling cuts and stuff like that to make them hex receivers. And they're, if they're perfectly servable, if serviceable, excuse me, then why scrap them? Why not just go ahead and incorporate them? You already put in the time. Everything else can be applied to it. And you still have a 9130 pattern. It just has an older receiver. So that's what happened with this one in particular. Now, we come back to our bolt. Now you'll see that we have a straight bolt handle. We do not have a Mauser designed bolt here. This is very much so a homegrown design and is a multi-piece design as well with a separate bolt head cocking piece as well as the actual area that holds the firing pin. This is a cock on open design. 
It has two locking lugs which lock horizontally as opposed to the Mauser's vertical locking lugs. We do not have a third locking lug for that kind of redundant pressure containing aspect of the Mauser Gewehr 98 action. We also do not have like the huge extractor and all this kind of stuff. This is a very simple bolt. This is a very simple gun in general. This is something that barely skilled labor can throw together. People who have literally been taught how to do a single action, they can put this rifle together. And that was the whole idea there. Now, we do have a five round magazine, which is of course hinged. It is exposed, but that's because the, the rimmed cartridge that this is chambered for has a tendency to take up a lot of space because, well, that's what rimmed cartridges do. Now, we do not have last shot hold open, which is a regret. And we'll talk about that more here in a little bit. Our safety is taking this cocking shroud. And what you do is you grasp this knurling here on the end, you pull back and you rotate counterclockwise in order to place the weapon on safe. And then when you wanna place it on fire, you pull back and rotate it clockwise and that lines it up for fire. Now, this grasping bit here also works for single cocking the rifle. Now our trigger, is actually surprisingly smooth. More here after a little bit. This rifle is set up to take stripper clips. Very important for this time period. You need a fast way to be able to load your rifles. You'll see here we have a straight stock design, which is not my preferred, but we'll cover that more here in a minute. And then we also have this relatively short length of pole, which is set up for your average Eurasian male. And a steel butt plate on the end. All right, guys, that pretty much covers features. So let's go ahead and go into our grading criteria. Now we have four areas we are going to discuss, and that is going to be ergonomics, features, firepower, and accuracy. Each one of these categories is going to be worth five points with a possible 20 points overall. All right, so let's start off with ergonomics. All right, so we have this straight pistol grip here. Not my favorite, I prefer a er, straight grip here. I prefer a semi-pistol grip so that I can better pull the rifle into my shoulders. Now, we also have a fairly short stock. Now, I generally prefer a short stock, if I'm being completely honest. However, this is a tad on the short side. Now, if I'm fighting in Russian winter, I could totally understand why you'd want something a little shorter. That way, when you put on heavy clothing, it's not you know, as much of a, a drastic shift on things, especially since the stock is not adjustable, but it's not, it's not my favorite. It's not, it's not the most comfortable in the world. Now we also have a straight bolt handle, which is not my preferred because it'll have a tendency to get like caught on things. And that's, that's kind of annoying overall, but it's not the worst thing in the world. If this had been a sniper rifle variant, it would have had an elongated and turned down bolt handle. That would have been kind of nice, but Say la vie, I guess. Um, the sling setup, I would have preferred more of like the Mauser style side sling setup. Uh, just holds the rifle a little bit better to the body as opposed to this, which kind of allows it to sort of hang. But that's, I mean, I guess that's neither here nor there. I am not a fan of the 28 inch long barrel. I, I think this is rather excessive. I don't know why this stuck around. I would have preferred to have seen something shorter. I like short rifles to begin with. I like light handy rifles to handle. Now I will say that the 44 and the 38 are definitely handier, but they come with their own issues as well. We'll talk about those here in a minute. Now, one more thing I wanna throw out about ergonomics. Yes, these finger grooves are very deep for grasping and they seem like they'd be fantastic for attempting to control a rifle for, you know, bayonet thrusts or something like that. However, I don't like how close in it makes it. It makes me feel a little unstable. I would prefer to have some sort of grasping spot a little bit further out on the rifle, personally. So with those issues, I award this rifle a one out of five for ergonomics. It, it just, it wasn't designed with that in mind. So with that being the case, let's talk about features. This rifle was designed to be simple, and it is. It is very simple. Now, 
Right off the bat, we have the split receiver design, which we can tell because we can see the bolt move back and forth. And if we look right here, we can see that this has a gap going on in there. So technically this is less rigid. In addition to that, in addition to being less rigid, we also have a simpler overall bolt setup. Now, those locking lugs are still beefy, but it's not nearly as strong as some of the other guns that we have and will talk about in these in this series. So, it's not the best bolt design ever. In addition to that, and one thing I will say for this bolt design is that the straight bolt handle does give me more mechanical advantage on the bolt, which is fantastic if I wind up with mud in the receiver somehow or I have a swelled casing or something like that, something that requires me to really have to jam my hand against the bolt. It is nice to have more mechanical advantage available to me for that purpose. So that's nice. I do appreciate that. Now, features-wise, I mean, we've got stripper clip feed. That's, that's important, but it's not necessarily in this category. Features-wise, this rifle's actually kind of thin, if I'm being 100% honest. It is very simple. It doesn't have additional takedown measures built into it or extra storage space or anything like that. It's pretty bare bones. Just enough to like be able to hand off to some guy who really doesn't have a good understanding of what he's supposed to be doing with the rifle anyway and send him on out to the front. Like, There's not a lot of frills built into this gun. So with that being the case, I award this a 2 out of 5. Okay, well, let's talk about firepower. Let's get into the firepower, guys. So we have a 7.62 by 5.4 millimeter round. That is fantastic from the standpoint of... Yeah, you know, a 30 caliber cartridge, so it's pretty much in line with everyone else. It's a major military cartridge, or in military terms, it's a major major caliber. It's not something a little bit smaller, you know, trying to go with like a 22 or something like that. Now, it is a rimmed cartridge, and there's a couple of things that come with that. So, great, we have strip clip feed, and that's very important. However, with rimmed cartridges, we potentially run into an issue with malfunction, specifically a phenomena known as rim lock, which is when the rim of the cartridge that's attempting to be loaded gets caught behind the cartridge below it in the magazine. Now, this is a thing that can be overcome, and there's a, a lot of like pre-planning on your ammunition that can make that not an issue to begin with, in addition to the interrupter switch, which is included with this magazine. However, you have to take those measures against it, as opposed to a rimless cartridge like, say, I don't know, an 8mm Mauser or a 30 6 which would not need those measures taken. If, if you see where I'm going with this. So we have we have a built-in possibility for malfunction from our ammunition, not from an operator error or some something failing mechanically with the gun. We're talking about just ammunition by how it's designed potentially gumming up the works. Now, in addition to that, capacity standard, five shots, that's pretty standard. You could bring up the uh, Lee Enfield, but even the Lee Enfield loads from two five-shot chargers. So you know, load the gun twice to shoot it for 10 rounds or load the gun twice to shoot it to 10 rounds. Like, that, it's, it's kind of the same there, especially if you're starting with an empty gun. Now, what about getting those rounds out? Now, the one thing, we'll go ahead and I'll, I'll decock it so I can show you guys. The one thing I will say for this bolt is it's gummy, especially when you're, you know, we're in the decocked position. It is not smooth to break that bolt, to cock that ham to cock the firing pin with the, uh, the cock on open design. It feels like this thing is held together by rubber bands. Now, one of the great things that kind of gets included in features is that it being a multi-piece design, we can swap out the bolt head. You know, if it gets damaged or during the assembly process for getting these rifles out the door. But because of features like that, it makes this feel like a stick. It's, it is very, very crunchy, very grimy, very unenjoyable. Now that is in stark contrast to the trigger, which is kind of surprising. Now triggers are something that vary wildly across these rifles. One trigger might feel fairly decent and the next not that great at all. This one is actually surprising overall. 
Now, it's the same kind of thing with barrels. You need to keep a very close eye on barrels because of potential damage caused from corrosive Burdan primers, which could very well have been causing the barrel to rust out because it wasn't properly cared for. That does happen frequently with these rifles and surplus ammunition. You have to keep an eye out for it. So, from a firepower standpoint, I award this rifle a 3 out of 5. Because it's more or less standard. It doesn't have a lot of malfunctions issues, and it's it's very difficult to choose what to give this, but it takes account for its potential issues. The potential issues are still present, so you know what? I'm going to change that from a 3 out of 5 to a 2 out of 5, because honestly, if they'd gone with a rim cartridge, it would have been better overall. So... I don't know, I'm curious to see how this gets received, because a lot of people affectionately, or inaffectionately, wait, no, affectionately or angrily term this a garbage rod, and I imagine there's a couple of people who right now are, are agreeing, and probably a small lower number of people who do not agree with the outcome on this rifle, but we haven't talked about accuracy yet. So, accuracy. Now. Let's talk about some of the things that play into accuracy. These sights are not my favorite. I don't care for this notch rear sight. It's it's just not, it doesn't draw my eye in. I spent, I feel like I spent a lot of time fishing around for this post front sight. Now the round protective cover does help me kind of like pull my eye into the front sight. And it's not nearly as bad as the Mauser hood, which I felt kind of put me in a hallway. But still, overall, it's not my favorite sight setup so far. So it's not really winning a lot of awards with the sights right now. What about actually shooting? Well, we've had some consistent issues with military surplus ammo. So I had a box of some semi-armor piercing ammunition and, well... I'll show you guys. So as you can see, once again, we had some uh, we had some issues, looking like some um, not quite. Oh wow, I already struggled with this term once today. <laughs> anyway, we had some issues, and for fear of potentially running into a squib load, because I definitely had a well impinged primer with no bang. Uh, we decided to put up that ammunition and switched over to Tulamo, which, or Tula Ammo, however it is that you want to pronounce that, I don't really care. 147 grain full metal jacket round. And at 25 yards, I managed to put together this two and seven eighths inch group, which was shooting rather rapidly. I'll roll in the, uh, the footage now. Yeah, we ripped through that pretty quickly. Uh, hang fire. Hang fire was the word I was looking for, by the way, guys. We had hang fires in the other ammunition. So, uh, with the Tula, we had no issue at all. And we managed to get that grouping at 25, shooting rather quickly. I was very surprised, especially with three pretty much in the same hole. Uh, I didn't measure that, but if I had to take a guess, that's probably coming in at under an inch for that three-shot group. So, I like that. 
I like that a lot. Now, because of the issues we have with the Mauser 98K, we could not do 100 yard testing because I, I, can't, I can't not have data to be able to represent for all of the guns in that case. So we will only be testing accuracy at 25 yards. However, I've shot, you know, generally, yeah, we're talking about a sample size of one, but I've shot a lot of different rifles in the Mosin Nagant family. And as far as actual shooting enjoyment, an M44 or an M38 has a lot of muzzle blast and a lot more recoil, as opposed to this, which is fairly enjoyable in the recoil aspect. It doesn't beat me up, and muzzle blast isn't nearly as bad because the 762 by 54 is actually designed for this barrel length and that full consumption of powder, unlike the 44 and 38. So when it comes to accuracy, right now, guys, this rifle's kind of in the lead because the Mauser didn't do that hot. So with that being the case, and off of information that I can actually provide you, not talking about my own preconceived notions and what I know rifles of, you know, perhaps better condition would be able to do, I'm going to award this a four out of five. So with that being the case, we have a nine out of 20 score for this rifle. All right, guys. That concludes this video. That's pretty much what I have for you. I hope you found it interesting and have a good day.